morning, ladies and gentlemen. How y'all doing out there? My name is Dr. John Belkowitz. Uh, we're here at Intelligent Concrete today for a Q&A Wednesday. Before we get to the meat of the presentation, I want you to take a second and click that bell down there. Like, subscribe, throw us your questions, your comments, your concerns. Don't forget we're the concrete experts. How did I do? Good. Yeah? I like that. Good. Mmm. So today we're going to talk about concrete, specifically colloidal silica, one of the harsh realities of colloidal silica. When I first started working with this, it was in a, a beautiful, wonderful lab here in Denver, Colorado, and then it went to a lab over in New Jersey, or a couple labs in New Jersey, it was these controlled environments. And one of the harsh realities that I didn't want to face at a certain point was the transfer of that technology from the lab to the field. You know, a good buddy of mine and a great speaker, Richard uh, Seishi, once said that there's a difference or there's this, this dichotomy between lab crete or book crete, lab crete, and real crete. And going from that lab to real crete is one heck of an issue with colloidal silica. It's one of these really sensitive technologies that works like a champ in the lab, but go into that field, it becomes something of a different monster. So that, that's the stage that I want to set. Why does colloidal silica work beautifully in the lab, but sometimes we see it fall flat on its face out in the field? And there's three things, and they all kind of center around the same basic ugh that happens or, or that ends up happening in the hydrated cement matrix. And the first one is bad chemistry. I think there was a band in the 80s called Bad Chemistry. Maybe there was a song. Anyway, bad chemistry. Colloidal silica is similar to those uh, polycarboxylate style high range water reducers where you need to be cognizant of the chemistry of the cement and then cement pore solution or the cementitious package or the blend of cementitious materials and the pore water solution. And the reason being is, we spoke about it before, this is our colloidal silicas. Every single one of those colloidal silicas uh, or, or nanosilica particles in dispersion is based on a very fine balance between the electrical double layer and the colloidal silica pH of that dispersion. Once you change up that dispersion, um, that catastrophic change can cause these particle or the electrical double layers of these particles to shrink. And instead of bouncing off of each other, they're going to stick together, which causes huge agglomeration. So, if you do have a very low alkali um, uh, cementitious package or, or, or cementitious material, you're, you're going to want to use larger particles that are not as sensitive to agglomeration just because they naturally have a larger electrical double layer and or treated nanoparticles just because, again, these are going to uh, have their own surface modifications that protect from dispersion as well as those electrical double layers. So again, like the larger particles, they're not as sensitive to that agglomeration. So that's number one. Number two is poor sequencing. Um, you know, the, the unfortunate reality is that um, the colloidal silica, carbon nanotubes, uh, nano TiO2, any of these nanoparticles, they rarely should be put on a dry material. It's very hard to stop those particles from bouncing into each other and sticking together. Uh, and, and I don't know of any dry nanoparticles that I would want to use that could get a universal dispersion in concrete. Uh, and as it stands, concrete is a very viscous material, so it's not going to allow those, those, those nanoparticles to move very much. So if you sequence them in the front end as opposed to the tail end of the mix, uh, you're going to be running into those agglomeration issues. And the biggest reason why we don't want agglomeration, we lose the efficiency of that nanoparticle, and in this instance, that nanosilica. Um, the other piece of that is what type of dispersing agent that you use in the concrete. Um, you know, as it turns out that we have a lot of high re or water reducers out there in the industry, the best one to use is a polycarboxylate style. Now there are a whole bunch of patents by different uh, you know, inventors out there, as well as a whole bunch of university research that goes into the best type of 
um, high range water reducer to use, but let's go on the flip side. Why do you don't want to use those mid ranges or those naphthalenes, those lignans, uh, when you're using a colloidal silica based admixture? And the reason being is it goes back to that surface potential, that electrical double layer that keeps that particle, that nanosilica particle, in suspension. Polycarboxylate style water reducers work based off of steric repulsion. They're not going to have a major impact on the pH or the electronegative potential of your pore water solution to include your colloidal suspension. Mid ranges, they have a direct impact on the electronegative potential. That's how they work. So, in doing so, they're going to turn your colloidal silica into cottage cheese or agglomerates, and it just won't work. Um, now, how do we get past these issues? First of all, if you're going to use a lower alkali cement, I mean there are some really low alkali cements below 0.4, um, use a treated colloidal silica, use a larger particle. Um, when it comes to the type of water reducer, I always recommend using a mid-range, um, or excuse me, a high range water reducer. Um, I have my favorites, I've talked about them in different situations. If you have to use a mid-range or a normal, then I would use a treated as opposed to a monodispersion or a polydispersion of your bare base colloidal silica particles. Um, but when you can, always use a high range. It's going to help that dispersion. And then the last thing is sequencing and mixing. Pretend colloidal silicas are like high range water reducers. In our industry, we've gotten used to putting high range water reducers at the tail end. I've actually done a, a mixing, I've done a, a sequencing on high range water reducers, coffee talk or live event that Patchouli will put a link in this section below. Um, and in that, I showed you what happens when you didn't sequence, you don't sequence it at the right time. So uh, we're going to go into that in a little bit more uh, with some of the papers that we do and I also talk about it when we go over our mixes. So that being said, all of this requires mixing energy. And to, to tie this whole thing up and wrap it together, to answer that question, why does my colloidal silica work in the lab versus the field? Everything that we've talked about is the colloidal silica bouncing into each other, sticking, and you know, creating those precipitates or, or that, those agglomerates. And we have lovely pictures of them um, that we've seen. Uh, I'm at 10 minutes. I've got to wrap this up. Um, what we have in the lab that's different from the field is, in the lab, we've got these Hobart mixers, these high shear mixers, that can go from anywhere between 100 to 2500 RPMs. Most of your ready mix trucks are anywhere between 3 and 12, or even less than that RPM. So you don't have a lot of mixing energy. Sorry, I was doing a photo up. We don't have a lot of mixing energy to begin with. so. Everything that we've talked about today is to, based off of the uh, work that we've done in the lab and the field, or the, the lab and the field, and, and we're just trying to help you set up that best environment for the colloidal silica to save the world with all the concrete in it. Thank you very much for joining us today. I hope I answered that question. Oh, wait. Um, did I answer that question? 1 to 2,500? Okay. Yeah, so hopefully I answered your question. If you got any other concrete questions or concrete concerns, don't forget to like, subscribe, throw those comments in the bottom below. Um, go concrete, and I'm getting a call right now. Sorry. Go concrete, beat asphalt.